Pettit kind of uses this language, but you know, I don't know if he, he goes all the way of saying why this is important, but another way of also being able to understand if something is arbitrary is understanding it as not needing to justify itself. So this you know, language of justification. Yeah. The the best example I can think of off the top of my head, because I actually um I acted when I was a theater major. Some of you might not be able to tell, but uh I've been on stage or two. But um, man is I a thespian, in, folks. I'm not saying I'm a renaissance man, but <laughs> draw your own conclusions. Um, Ibsen's A Dollhouse. It's a fascinating play where, you know, um, the husband, he actually seems by contemporary standards of the time, a decent guy. And yet you're clearly supposed to walk away from this with the understanding that, you know, the main character, the woman of the play is dominated by her husband or perhaps by the institution of marriage. How do you, how do you get there? Well, even if the husband is nice, he gives her money whenever she asks for it, doesn't track where she's going, etc. But there's this thing in the, the, the structure of it that if the husband wanted to choose to do something we understand we're supposed to understand implicitly he doesn't have to justify himself to her and so if he decides not to you know give her an allowance or money anymore then you know, we can see how that kind of tracks you know, um an interference of her interests but i think what makes it arbitrary is even if he's a good guy and he does give justifications i think you know what pet is trying to say is he doesn't have to and that you know the arbitrary domination, you know, whether it's even with the power companies or something like that, they don't have to justify themselves to you. In fact, that's what can be so maddening about bureaucracy. You know, just like, get me to somebody who can plead my case and you're like, these are the rules. I don't know what to tell you. In our system, it says you didn't pay the bill. I don't know what to tell you. And obviously laws are supposed to mediate that, but I think this notion of justification and not being able to justify to oneself why they are doing this and be able to contest other justifications of why people are doing things to us. Yeah, or you know, being able to fire people without yeah. having to, with no justification, with no ability to contest it. You know, the employer-employee relationship is, I think, you know, one of the yeah. one of the paradigmatic examples of what that arbitrary will looks like. Bosses. Yeah, what this like whole distinction allows us to see is that you could be non-interfered on uh, just totally contingently, just by chance. Yeah. You could be lucky that you have yeah. like a nice well, boss. And that's where the utilitarian calculation sucks. I mean, it's yeah. completely it, it's useless in that situation because, yeah, you could have bosses or you could have slave masters or you could have like husbands under patriarchy that happen to like you, know, you do a utility calculation and like there's a net benefit. Obviously, uh, this is a very crass, like vulgar sense of utilitarianism, no, this but is it's it. the Bentham. It's <laughs> the Bentham. It doesn't get better yeah. than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> but like, OK, Damn. it can't tell. You, but the, and that's why elites at those, those determinative historical moments just were like, yeah, this like screw this Republican stuff. Like the non-domination stuff is way too taxing. If we actually try to make it apply universally to all human beings, let's do this other thing, informed by utilitarianism and by and that like really as he puts it, privileges natural liberty over civil liberty. Yeah, like, that's one of the things he says about liberalism mm. is that. For it, for it, the highest good is like natural liberty. The way it conceives of freedom is primarily as natural liberty, meaning just you're in the state of nature. No, no one's there to really bug you. Nothing's in your way. There is no – all constraints are necessarily an imposition, right? All constraints are necessarily bad and not the mm. concept of civil liberty, which funny enough like is in Locke and is certainly in Rousseau. Uh, it says that no, no, freedom is actually realized through a system of constraints that is like in your interests, that is – responsive that is responsive to your needs and your interests and your can be contested I mean, sorry those two points are a little bit unrelated it is kind of funny that on this construal we end up having to say something that like hobbes is a liberal and Locke is a republican <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean there are moments where i was reading P pettit and i was like you're giving a gloss on Locke here that's making me feel a little bit more sympathetic i know <laughs> i've never felt i've never felt better <laughs> yeah. about the boy <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. avoiding all the property <laughs> stuff, avoiding all the property stuff and just focusing on the stuff about like consent of the governed and civil liberty and what it means to be free as a citizen versus free as a natural subject. Well, it does go back to Hobbes, right? Like Hobbes does say that like all law is constraint and freedom exists only there where there is no law, right? And uh, Hobbes so, has the best concept of freedom. I'm sorry. Unobstructed motion. <laughs> just moving. Such a good, not simple. Getting, not hitting anything. Simple. Just move gliding. On. Unobstructed motion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You love that early modern physics brain, you know? 
<laughs> just like a lack of friction. There you go. Solved <laughs> like it for you. Got it. Can't believe we spent hundreds of years on this this concept. Well, can I ask you just uh, before we get away from this? I just want to ask one thing. If we yeah. could discuss it for a minute, which is the contrast between freedom as non-domination and freedom as self-legislation or autonomy. Right? Do you mean like the, po kind of, the positive sense? Yeah, the positive sense, the self self mastery. I, I'm specifically thinking about self-legislation. You know, by the time you get to Rousseau. You get a conception of freedom that is not the opposite of constraint, but is when those constraints are constraints you give yourself. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. on the personal level, to be free is to be moral. Kant ends up taking this over. To be free is to impose the moral law on yourself, to be autonomous in that sense. And politically, to be free as a polity, like to live in a free society, uh, is to be collectively self-legislating, right? So that the people gives themselves the law. So I, I, it was totally clear to me why this Republican concept of non-domination is superior to the non-interference notion of freedom. Right? The, the non-interference notion of freedom is completely juvenile. It's a toddler's notion of freedom. And unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, it becomes yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. It is. I, I want to, I want to, I, 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 I have a toddler now and, it's just, and I recognize, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. I want to do stuff. <laughs> Don't get in my way. You're like, stopping. You're me. not. You're not dominating I, L. I, I right. want, but you can't have it because for the X, Y, and Z reasons, I don't care. I, like you know, don't tread on me. Okay, so 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 I get the, the okay. I'm being a little bit you know fast and loose here. No, but no, no. The contrast again. again with, you're not, but go. The, con the contrast. With, so I get that, but why the like? And I know he makes arguments for it, but maybe I want to hear what you guys have to think. What you have to say. Um, why? Why is it superior? The freedom as non-domination. Why is it superior? in your view, to freedom as like self-legislation, as giving oneself principles, as collectively de being self-determining. Self-determination. Uh, yeah, let's just draw a contrast between non-domination yep. and self-determination. I, I think that there are different levels at which to answer this question, because I think at one level it is hard to draw apart. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty partial to the self-legislation yeah. model, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> so, yeah. and then, but there's a, another level at which I think it is a little more intuitive that they're different. So the level at which I, I agree I don't always understand is like if the point is like legitimacy and the rule of law, like in in a way there's the the Kantian view just like starts to like – emerge and people have tried to interpret him as a, as in fact a republican in in response mm. to the the french revolution as opposed to a proto liberal and that's the version of kant that like makes me more sym sympathetic mm -hmm. where what you're talking about is you know the kingdom of ends and all this but like the idea is that like a meta political level a free society is probably self determining in that way but i mm. I, th I wonder if or mm. I, I don't know. I've never been convinced that it's not. I'm, I also have this question. I think the level at which they are different is the extent to which those laws that the free society is meant to secure something that is actually fundamentally negative. Non-domination is not a positive prescription about how you need to re relate to the polity. It's like that's the that's the fundamental. Mm -hmm. like, it's like that's the necessary condition for you to be able to relate to it in a free way, mm -hmm. but it's not prescribing the way in which you, like the prescription is not ipso facto mm -hmm. in the definition of li liberty itself. I think this c could be hair splitting, to be honest, but there is something intuitive about this because when you start looking at, um, you know, I was just in the in East Germany for four days and you start looking at the way people were talking about, like in order to get people to relate to the state in a certain way, whether by necessity or genuine conviction, the state had to posit like a certain kind of person. And some of it is actually extremely romantic and beautiful and not at all drab and horrible, like just making ordinary people's lives seem like they were valuable and what they were doing was constructing the socialist republic and so on. But it is a very clear prescription about like for the common good, you have to be this kind of way and and so I think what Pettit really wants is to try to pull those moments apart. I don't know if he's successful. Well, no, so the whole thing, I think, to take a step back, right, the book departs with a discussion of that really famous and influential essay by Isaiah Berlin, right, the two concepts of liberty, the two notions, concepts, whatever, um, right, the negative and the positive. And I think kind of to your point, Owen, like, we're going to spend most of the book talking about the contrast with negative liberty or at least in the chapters that we read i don't know i haven't read the rest of the book yet but he sort of kind of just accepts or just like uncritically allows like berlin's pretty 
condemnatory discussion of positive liberty just to kind of just happen right he's like yeah you know since berlin we've seen that there's this like ancient notion of positive freedom as self-mastery that shit sucks you know it leads to totalitarianism it leads to communism all the bad things we don't like but then we have this new modern notion of liberty that is like you know in line with enlightenment rationality um and it's not interference right this negative thing so we're then going to spend a lot of time being like here's why non-domination is not non-interference and i do buy all of that but i do wonder right like oh and the other thing that he says that's funny is like and happily says berlin like you know, where in modern philosophy do we find this nice modern rational notion of negative liberty? Like all of our good common sense British and Scottish people, right? And where is all the positive liberty stuff? <laughs> oh, it's those fucking Boys. freak Germans and those romantic weirdos, <laughs> those goddamn continental folks. Right? Those continentals. So, so definitely yeah. leave that in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're an island of freedom <laughs> and progress. Uh, just to put a button on it, I think that you've got to be right, Lillian, that the difference has to be that Self-legislation presumably is a kind of a uh, good thing in most cases, I would think, or at least contestability about why I don't like the way in which I feel this is not self-legislative as representing me. But that's kind of not the point for the Republican orientation, right? The point is the lack of a of an arbitrary capacity to intercede in, in my life, right? To restrict me in some way. And so they may end up converging like in practice or in content, but those are different guiding threads. It seems to me. I don't know if that answers to your question either, Owen. I think it's a, a really good question. No, that's helpful. Um, so one argument that I've heard about why make this distinction, uh, and I'm not necessarily convinced by this argument, is that the reason why one ought to be suspicious of even the positive account of, of self-legislation is that all the Republican accounts meant to secure is, as Gil was saying, the suspension of arbitrary power. But once you include the positive account, then it can seem as if it's not just about self-legislation, but there is actually a demand and an expectation that one participates in the polity, as Lydia was saying, in a certain way. But you know, also think of it this way, it can also seem as if for every single law, you must participate in giving feedback on the law. You have to be a type of person who's able to give feedback on the law. And so I think the suspicion is, you know, having the positive account can seem like, you know, um, a type of onerousness mm. that, you know, makes it seem as if actually freedom is having to always be engaged in politics. And there is something about that that I would also find intuitive. <laughs> like, I don't want to spend my whole life in the, the random democratic, you know, processes that keep popping up every second every time we find some new material we've got to vote on what we're going to do with it and i'm just like when do i get to play video games <laughs> i don't necessarily think it has to go that way but and i actually don't have a genuine answer to this i i think that I don't want us to be too quick, though, even though we want to be wary of the potential conservative elements of the notion of civic virtue that goes into republicanism. I think that there is a type of molding that is supposed to happen uh, in the people so that they can reproduce generationally practices of non-domination, a type of comportment you have to freedom, to oneself, et cetera. And so you know, I, I, I don't think we can... Uh, maybe we can, but uh, I'll say polemically, I'm not sure we can completely slough off the, the civic virtue aspect of it. I certainly think not completely, especially if you think about like transition questions in between like domination and freedom. Like one of the things that I think is really helpful about the non-domination view is that non-domination and freedom are opposite terms, but because there's a gradation and like amount and like the extent like domination varies in intensity you know there's a mm -hmm. better there's a way in which right. unlike liberal non-interference there is a better and worse to this spectrum so in real historical time freedom and domination actually do coexist so you know you can think about um and, and it gives you a way to think about ameliorating conditions of domination in order to transition from one to the other if domination is like a real problem and it's not just like an academic problem, which I think it is, then people, and then this is the self-emancipation claim that the Marxist tradition has always made, then people need to do things to reconfigure themselves to be able to live more freely because other, no one else is going to do it for them. So 
the demands on people under conditions of domination necessitate acting in a certain way. So when Mary Wollstonecraft, I think her, her was some of her best arguments are that she says very polemically, and Simone de Beauvoir says the same shit. We just don't like to say this about women these days, but it's not a false consciousness argument. It's that, listen, when you live in a servile situation, you become servile. So when you live in a in a depend, state of dependency, then you are, in fact, as servile and dependent as you seem. This has negative effects on your state of mind. It prevents you from expanding the scope of political imagination that you have from wanting different things. And if you're going to get out of that state, then you need to like start behaving differently, cultivating virtues of mind that allow you to see in Wollstonecraft's case independence as 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 a virtue and she says that like actually also for the dominators like the dominators become what she calls unmanly oh yeah because <laughs> yeah she says it's a very them. unmanly Get way of living <laughs> if you have to have someone be dependent on you it creates in a way a slavishness in your own mind because you are not able to like walk around in the world and have self-respect because forcing other people to be subject to you is not self-respect it's parasitism um, yeah. And she relates this mm -hmm. to the property question. And I think Frederick Douglass makes the same argument. So the things that like black Republicans in the U.S. were arguing in the 19th century about like the corrupted moral nature. I think we talked about this in previous episodes, the corrupted moral nature of the dominators. If you're going to change a society, if this is all true, and I think to some extent it is, then, yeah, they, people have to change. You know, I don't know what else mm -hmm. to say about yeah. this. And the labor movement is very clear about this. You're not going to be able to keep doing what you've always done and bring about the changes that you want. And I think a lot of this becomes more intelligible, like if you understand that domination is a structural problem and that some counterforce to it is what is required to change the structural problem. Otherwise, the arguments about cervic virtue are moralistic, but it's moral, it's a kind of moralism that is a little different from just like, you know stop being such a <laughs> slacker or whatever, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, I think the virtue thing, I don't know, always know where to place it or like in the Republic, the just Republic, what would virtue be like? I think that's kind of the question we were just discussing, but like the idea that you could just get rid of the virtue part, if you take the problem of domination seriously is like, I think that's wild. I don't think it's possible. Hmm. So one thing is that because of the specific character of domination as opposed to interference that Pettit's doing such a good job at drawing our attention to is that it's not about it's not about the actual. It's about what's possible. Right. And it means that, you know, even when I'm not being interfered upon, I can still be dominated. And importantly, part of how that works, then, is my being aware of the situation of my domination even when I'm not actively being interfered upon, right? When no one's like coercing me, the domination works in part through my understanding and awareness that someone has arbitrary power over me. And so he starts talking about how like there's a kind of common knowledge to the situation of domination mm -hmm. that both dominators and dominated have, right? They're, or at least that have, they have access to if they're not like thinking about it right now. It's something that upon reflection, you could go like, oh, yeah, no, I do have arbitrary power over you and I do exert that. So interestingly, then both the situations of domination and non-domination, as he points out, have important subjective and intersubjective effects on the people who find themselves in these situations, right? Mm -hmm. So that like, to go back to the play, the Ibsen play, right? Like, even though he doesn't seem to think he is doing anything wrong, like there is a way in which this changes his comportment. He acts in different ways because of the intersubjective awareness of the situation of domination that he enjoys and vice versa, in situations of non-domination, like this genuinely sort of spontaneously starts to push in the direction, I think, of the cultivation of these civic virtues of understanding oneself as independent, as not sort of subject in an arbitrary and capricious way. For this reason, I'm like not so worried about whenever people start like really getting nervous about the civic virtue stuff. I'm like, really? Why? I don't know. Just people. It seems to be kind of just like people being cognizant of not being dominated. And that's cool. And that means you carry yourself differently and relate to others in a, in a less demeaned and demeaning way. Hey, thanks so much for listening. This was just a small sample of the full episode. To listen to it and to access other premium content we're putting out, including all of our locked episodes and bonus videos, please subscribe to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophy. See you next time.